Welcome back to the Youth Bible in One Year, day 300. Today we're talking about challenging contradictions. And a lot of people say that the Bible is full of contradictions. And there are many apparent contradictions. But how do we determine what to do with these apparent contradictions? And how do we deal with them in our own minds? Let's find out today. I have often heard it said that the Bible is full of contradictions. It is certainly true that there are many apparent contradictions. When faced with challenging contradictions, seek to harmonise the apparent contradictions within the message of the Bible as a whole. Avoid artificial means of harmonisation. Be patient, be prepared to wait and live with unresolved questions. From Proverbs 26 Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be like them yourself. Answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. To answer or not to answer. The words fool, foolish, folly occur 96 times in the book of Proverbs. The fool is the opposite of the wise person commended by the writer of Proverbs. He says, Do not answer fools according to their folly, or you will be like them yourselves. Answer fools according to their folly, or they will be wise in their own eyes. This couldn't be a clearer apparent contradiction. If the two verses appeared in different sections of the Bible, it would be hailed as an obvious contradiction. However, the fact that they appear right after each other suggests that in the author's eyes, there is no actual contradiction. Criticism can often be extremely helpful and we can learn from it. However, sometimes criticism comes from ignorance, from fools. How do we respond? There's a tension. On the one hand, we do not want to reply because, in a sense, it's descending to the level of the critic, the fool. On the other hand, we want to reply because otherwise the critic may feel that they're right and they will be wise in their own eyes. It may well be that the writer of Proverbs is using the dilemma to make a humorous point, that when it comes to talking with fools, whether you respond or stay silent, you can't win. It's very tempting to think that the fool is someone else and not me. If we think this, then we are wise in our own eyes. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for fools than for them. This is the sting in the tail. After making us smile, By showing how silly fools can be, we're reminded that when we think we are wise, we're even worse off than a fool. Lord, preserve me from being wise in my own eyes. Give me wisdom in all my decisions and how I answer my critics. New Testament from Titus 2 You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and in sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be kind so that no one will malign the word of God. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. In every way, make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Boring or attractive? If Christianity is to be credible and attractive to the world, Christians must live authentic and attractive lives. Paul writes to Titus that in every way we should make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. The instructions he gives about teaching women to be reverent, self-controlled, pure, kind and so on are so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, the instructions he gives to Titus about self-control, integrity and so on are so that 
They have nothing bad to say about us. However, as we read his instructions, they are the very opposite of what our 21st century culture would think is attractive. He speaks of sound doctrine, being temperate, self-controlled, sound in faith, reverent, not addicted to too much wine, virtuous and pure, living disciplined lives, showing integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech, saying no to ungodliness and worldly passions and living self-controlled, upright and godly lives. All this sounds very unattractive to modern ears. Yet when we actually see someone living like this, Mother Teresa or Pope Francis to name but two, it's very attractive. Our culture dislikes the idea of holiness, but when people see a holy life, they are captivated by it. True holiness is when you leave every person more alive than when you found them. As Simon Wiles put it, imaginary evil is romantic and varied. Real evil is gloomy, monotonous, barren, boring. Imaginary good is boring. Real good is always new, marvellous, intoxicating. There is something beautiful about lives of dignity and wisdom, healthy faith and love, people who are models of goodness and virtuous and pure, lives of good character, shining through action, God-filled, God-honouring lives. Jesus died for you and me to free us from a dark, rebellious life into this good, pure life, making us a people he can be proud of, energetic in goodness. Lord, help me by my life and by my love to make the teaching about you attractive. Old Testament from Habakkuk 1-3 to How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Though the fig tree does not bud, There are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and fields produce no food, though there are no shepherd in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Faith and Doubt Are doubts, questioning and fears compatible with faith? Are you facing problems with your relationships, your marriage, your lack of marriage, your family, your job, your health, your finances, or a combination of all of these? Does this make you doubt the existence of God? Should you stop believing? Many people regard faith as unquestioning. They think faith and doubt are opposites. In fact, faith and doubt are two sides of the same coin. There is no doubt that 2 plus 2 equals 4. However, it does not take any faith to believe it. On the other hand, to believe that someone loves you is open to an element of doubt. To put your faith in God is similar to loving a person. There's always the possibility of doubt. Without doubt, faith would not be faith. Likewise, it's not wrong to question God within the context of faith. The book of Habakkuk starts with a man who believes yet questions. It ends with a towering expression of faith, scarcely equaled anywhere else in the Old Testament. Habakkuk looked at the world and was perplexed and fearful. He saw violence, injustice, destruction, strife and conflict. Yet the Lord did not seem to him to be doing anything about it. He saw pain and suffering and asked, How long, O Lord, why? He took the problem to God and asked genuinely heartfelt questions. God replied that he was going to do something amazing. And not what Habakkuk expected. He was raising up the Babylonians. Consequently, Israel was to be overwhelmed and would go into exile. 
Habakkuk was perplexed. Surely God was in control of history and all-powerful. How could a pure God use the cruel and idolatrous Babylonians to punish a godly nation? God, you chose Babylonians for your judgment work. You can't be serious. You can't condone evil. Habakkuk didn't seem to get a direct answer. However, he took his puzzled complaints and problems to God and left them with him as he waited. God told him first to write down the vision. When you sense God speaking to you and giving you a vision, it's good to write it down so that you can refer back to it and hold on to it. Second, God told him that he may have to wait for the answer. Wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. God wants you to bring your doubts, problems and questions to him. You may not always get immediate answers to all your questions. While you wait for answers, you are called to trust in God, even when you don't fully understand what he's doing. Faith involves believing what God has said in spite of the difficulties you face. The righteous will live by their faith. Habakkuk foresaw that judgment was coming on the ungodly Babylonians. He also foresaw that one day the outlaws would be destroyed and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. He foresaw the ultimate triumph of good over evil. Until that time, he resolved to stay close to God whatever happened. Like Habakkuk, commit yourself to praise and not complain. Resolve to take the long-term view and be patient. Resolve to rejoice whatever the circumstances. Commit yourself to faith even when there is no fruit. God is concerned not so much about the harvest as about your heart. Even if you can find nothing else, you can rejoice over your relationship with the Lord. Habakkuk says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. God made him sure-footed and light-hearted. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. As Joyce Meyer writes, we need to allow our difficulties to help us develop hinds feet. When we have hinds feet, we will walk and make progress through our trouble, suffering, responsibility, or whatever is trying to hold us back. Lord, Help me to trust completely in you as I honestly express my doubts and questions to you and to rejoice in you even when I do not immediately see an answer. Pippa adds, In Habakkuk 3 verse 17 it says, Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. You may feel your life is as bleak as this picture that the writer of Habakkuk paints, but he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. He is making a choice and focusing his eyes not on his circumstances, but on God who can save him. Let's pray. Lord, help me today to figure out these apparent contradictions in your word. Give me understanding today to look in your Bible and find the truth. Help me to see your love in the pages. Help me to find knowledge, to know you more. Jesus, help me today. Amen.